Let's welcome in our co-hosts this uh, fine Monday morning, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy, good to see you again. It is a fine Monday morning. Good morning, Rob. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Johnny. Good morning. Welcome back. Uh, thank you. I uh, got a chance to see you two fine gentlemen Friday night at the hospice event at uh, the Bavarian Inn, which was attended, by, I understand, by 314 people. Uh, a lot of money was raised, Bill. I don't know if you know the final figure yet, but it was impressive. Yes, over $35,000 for the auction items themselves. If you consider the sponsors, is about $250,000. That's quite an event for for one quite about a lot of money for one event yeah but it goes for an, a phenomenal cause hospice and a really cool thing happened uh john gilstrap had offered to auction off a character name in his next book and i don't know if you were nervous at first as to how that was going to go over john or not but it really started to pick up steam. It did. It got it. It it, it went for a high number. I don't know that it's appropriate to, to mention it. Sure but it I was is. very happy. Um, very appropriate. It, could, it went for like twenty three hundred dollars. I think it was twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah. Okay. Sure. And several folks bid, but who were the last two that bid in head to head? I know who the winner was, and that we say it. Yeah. That yeah. was Mike Height. And the one yeah. bidding against him I, was Jason was, Barrett. Uh, that's what I two, thought. I wasn't yeah, sure. And, and Hornby was in there, too. Yeah. I'm sorry. Hornby who? was in there, too, bidding. Yeah, yeah. Early, but the, but toward the end, going uh, to the bid, is primarily between Jason and Mike Height. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's always the fear. Whenever you put something up for bid, I believe the opening bid was $250. Yeah. And you're always afraid, like... Okay, how about a hundred dollars? Somebody, yeah. Okay, come on. Well, at be... first, when when Maria Lawrenson, who was really doing a heck of a job uh, helping to announce the things and get the auction going, uh, it was like silence for like a couple, like five seconds. Nothing happened, and I, and I, I was thinking, oh my goodness, I feel so bad for John if no one bids on this. Oh my goodness. Would but, you really though? Because you'd have good material for Monday. Well. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> Everything can be part of a bit, but that doesn't mean I don't have empathy for you. That's yeah. true. But as a write-up in preparation, John said that most of the uh, uh, when he, most of the characters, good characters, already established. Yes. So the one that would uh, that would win the auction would probably be a bad character, and the bad characters die horrendous deaths. <laughs> so, it is so, a thriller. <laughs> it is a thriller. Sometimes slow and painful. So, but it uh, it was great, and the whole the whole evening was wonderful, and that's the first time I've been to one of those at the Bavarian Inn uh, for hospice, and I was there because Joanna and Dave Wadsworth couldn't make it. Yeah. They asked uh, me and Colleen, my wife, to step in uh, because their place up at Deep Creek was being auctioned off, yeah. uh, and uh, I think that went to you, John. Yes, it did. Can't wait. You'll yeah. love it. it I, that's well, you've, it comes highly recommended by a man I admire. Yes. <laughs> hey, can I shamelessly self-promote for a second? Yeah. Please. Um, I'm, I'm going to be teaching a writing seminar free of charge. At, it's a four-hour seminar at Shepherdstown Public Library. Uh, it's called Adrenaline Rush, How to Write Suspense Fictions. It starts at 1 o'clock on July 8th. There's a lot of stuff that a lot of writing teachers have told writers. These are folks who never sold anything that's just wrong, I believe. And so there's an audience for writers and teachers of writing and anybody that's been interested in, in following that line of, of, of work or, or uh, entertainment to uh, sign up free of charge, folks. You want to contact Lee Ann at sheplibrary.org or call her at 901-229-1065. That's pretty cool because I think the genesis of that came from an interview he did with somebody from Shepherdstown Library. Yes. Right? Yeah. You guys started talking about maybe you could do a seminar there. Right. That, that's pretty cool. Very nice, uh, Rob. Before you, uh, before we leave hospice, we're talking about hospice. The our guest this morning, uh, Ashley Horse, who you'll introduce in a new capacity in just a second. Ashley was instrumental in getting the uh, Hollywood Nights uh, hospice the way it is now. So uh, uh, she, even though she was not there last Friday night, she deserves a lot of credit for the success of the Hollywood Nights. Yes, as I, if I recall, Ashley, you came uh, highly recommended to the institute. By Mr. Stubblefield from Hospice. I did. I spent 15 years with Hospice of the Panhandle and uh, was very proud to be a part of Hollywood Nights when that was from its first launch until yeah. just until last year. So, 
And Maria just started talking to Bill again after we left. <laughs> well, yes, and several people on Friday night uh, did not even know my name. They just said, you're the one that stole Ashley from us. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great stuff, Ash. You must Thank be you. proud uh, with that. I, I am very proud. It is Hospice is such a wonderful organization, and it was a great place to work. They do such wonderful wonderful work and the mission you can't beat the mission and it's very mission focused and so it was it was a hard place to leave but the Stubblefield Institute also does very worthwhile work and it's an exciting time there to see where we're going and what's up next so what's up next is we have a panel discussion called um, it's health it's about health care and it is about growth civility and stress Growth, civility, and stress. You don't Correct. see those three words together a lot. Exactly. And that's why we're putting them together. And so really the motivation behind this panel discussion, which was originally scheduled for June 8th, um, unfortunately, one of our key panelists, Dr. Clay Marsh, had an unavoidable conflict arise. And so we have rescheduled it for June 29th. It's still at the Bird Health Sciences Center on the campus of Berkeley Medical Center. It's at six o'clock. And it really arose out of several different factors. First, you have that the rate of violence against healthcare workers is rapidly rising. And being a nurse or a basically a bedside healthcare worker is quickly becoming one of the most dangerous professions in the mer in America. Not based on the number of deaths, but on the rates of workplace violence. And so clearly I think we can see that something is happening here that we need to talk about. Uh, we also have, of course, we're coming out of the pandemic. Uh, the emergency order just expired. And so we all know that, and definitely while I wasn't on the, well, I was on the administrative side of healthcare during the pandemic. If you are, if you were a healthcare worker, you know what happened there. It was on one side, our healthcare workers were our heroes, but on the other side with the policies that had to be enacted, trying to follow all of the orders coming out from the government of obviously the vaccine debate, there was a lot of stress and a lot of animosity then towards healthcare workers. Then when you come to the public side and those of us who are engaging with the healthcare system, uh, the growth in the area has been a challenge and I know a lot of us are seeing that it's more difficult to get appointments with our healthcare providers. Um, we have a national healthcare provider shortage coming. Um, we're in the beginning of it, but we don't have enough people graduating from medical school and going into professions like nursing to meet the population demands. And so there's a lot of frustration related to that. I know during the pandemic, we also saw a little bit of a breakdown of our trust in the healthcare system. And so all of these together is, is what leads us to have this conversation of not only what happened, a little bit of a pandemic debriefing, but also what's happening now? Why, why does it take me so long to get an appointment with my healthcare provider? And how can we work together in the future to ensure a positive environment for all of us? Billy. Yeah, uh, who will be on the panels? So because we have just changed the um, date, we're still working to confirm everyone. But we do have Dr. Clay Marsh, who um, most of us know as West Virginia's COVID czar. He's really the one who led Governor Justice through the pandemic. We have Dr. Kevin McLaughlin, who is the Berkeley County, Morgan County Health Department Medical mm -hmm. Director. We have Dr. Michael Laudner, who is an ER physician at Berkeley Medical Center. He's the head of the emergency department. We have um, Dr. Alvin Moss, who um, some people know he used to be with the West Virginia Center for End of Life Care. That's how I know of him. But he's also with the um, West Virginia University Bioethics Program. Now he's going to give, I assume he's going to give some of a different view than some of the other panelists because he, we interviewed him a couple of times on WRNR and I believe he takes the position that vaccinations were unwarranted. Is that correct? So from, and one, one thing I do want to make clear is that we are looking for diverse perspectives. Exactly. Yeah. And so it is important to us to have diverse perspectives on the panel. Um, from what I've read from Dr. Moss, he is 
he is critical of vaccines and he does he does not advocate for vaccines being mandated for all people he he really advocates for people to be able to look at the vaccine and decide whether it's right for me or not, and especially for school systems, to be able to give exceptions to those who don't feel that it's right for their child for a variety of reasons. Yeah, if I can pick up on that Absolutely. quickly. The, one of the uh, tenets or basic thesis of the Institute is trying to present as many different views as we mm -hmm. can in a civil, polite manner. Uh, at no time does the Institute ever propose to convert someone to their views. That's not the, that's not the intent. It's just trying to get a wide spectrum of views discussed in an intelligent, articulate, civil, polite manner. Absolutely. So we we do want those who are in healthcare, who are healthcare leaders in our area to be able to speak because they can answer the specific questions of what's happening with Valley Health, what's happening with Berkeley Medical Center. Uh, but we also want the alternative viewpoint. We want the statewide viewpoint. And we are also we will also be having a representative of the community who works in a health advocacy position to ask questions or to participate. And and it's going to be, you mentioned it's going to be the time at the uh, at WVU Medical Center. It can also be accessed by by Zoom, by uh, Facebook. What are the other avenues? Um, so we have partnered with um, WEPM to air it, to stream it live, and then to air it on their radio station live at the same time. So. Yeah, I think historians are going to look back at this time and find that, that the decrease in civility is directly tied to the shutdown of diverse opinions. So I think the ability you know, to, to have both sides presented in, in full voice is how we put society back together again. I want to get back to the violence against um, healthcare workers. Is it workplace violence in the sense, it, writ large, it's obviously across the board, but is there an increase of employees harming employees or is it mostly angry patients hurting healthcare workers? It's typically angry patients or family members hurting healthcare workers. And it, it, obviously you can pursue this, I guess, in, in, the, in the panel discussions. Any thoughts as to why? I mean, is it in the, is it in the ER for the most part or is it up on the, the floors as well? Um, it's really across the spectrum, and it's not only in the hospital, but it's also, I know I come from a, with hospice, a home health, home care setting, but it's also happening there. Um, my, my suspicion is that during the pandemic, we became less tolerant of each other. We, I mean, for two years, we were separated from one another. We were, we have higher levels of stress because we're con we were constantly bombarded with the fear and the anger and we were shuttled away so that we were only talking to those are who are closest to us who tend to think the same way that we do. Mm -hmm. um, not always, but that tends to be what happens. And so I really think that we just have difficulty with the capacity of interacting with those who either disagree with us or a lot of times when we're engaging with healthcare, it's a stressful time where either hearing that we're dealing with a disease or an illness or there's significant expense involved and we're concerned about whether we, we can financially afford our health care, uh, especially if you're dealing with a parent or a child, then there's additional emotional stressors happening. And so overall, it's a stressful time and we, we just we're not dealing with it as well. And what do you suspect the impact of growth is on all of this? So the impact of growth is that we have more people trying to tax what is the same healthcare services. And so the law of supply and demand means that there's more stress on the system because now we have 120,000 or 150,000 as opposed to 100,000 people trying to access the same services. And as I said, with the national shortage of healthcare providers, even though our major healthcare systems are recruiting continuously, I talk. I still have contacts with those who are in leadership positions in both Valley Health and Berkeley Medical Center, um, well, W Medicine, and Shenandoah Community Health, and they're constantly trying to recruit, and it's very difficult. So, it's interesting. Just in, in general, I don't think the healthcare industry is undergoing anything that anybody else isn't as well. 
That in, is correct. In the sense that you're talking about more frustration by the customer, mm-hmm. right, which leads to violence. Think about every story you've heard about airline travel over the oh, last absolutely. couple of years and, and the assaults on flight attendants. And uh, in regards to shortages of the people who, right now I think I heard that there's 1.8 jobs available for every one unemployed person right now in America. So that's nearly a two to one ratio, right? For every person unemployed, there are 1.8 jobs open, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and, and all of this leads to, and for healthcare, I think you can go back probably a good dozen years uh, for when this stress really started to hit the fan, so to speak, and think about your favorite doctor has probably retired over the last couple of years. Right. Your favorite doctor was replaced most likely by a PA or a nurse practitioner. You probably started seeing that person who then left that practice a year or two later, maybe to get completely out of medicine <laughs> or to go to a different practice. Many of the practices have been swallowed up by larger providers Correct. like hospitals who've now kind of assumed monopoly power over the healthcare system in, in a community. And Who's the frustration really over in most cases? I would guess. I'm, I don't have a scientific fact to back this up. Probably your health insurance provider. Your premium has gone up substantially over the last couple of years, right? So a lot of people have to make a choice. Do I have health insurance or do I pay the rent, right? And your co-pays have probably gone up while the level of service has probably gone down. And all of that leads to the same frustration you're seeing in the schools, on the airlines, in the convenience store anywhere since the last couple of years. You know, in 2019, I had a spinal fusion surgery because I had uh, disc issues in my neck that resulted in horrible pain down my, my left arm. So it was just unbearable. And I've, I have took three weeks, I think, to schedule the surgery and, and be out of the pain. A friend of mine suffering the same thing, he's looking at a nine-month wait to get the same surgery I got, and that's that would be a long, long nine months. And then you add to that the folks who would have had that at the beginning of the pandemic, they've had to wait two years in order to, to get rid of it. So you know, if, if that is the seed of, of anger and unrest, I certainly understand it. It's never justified to take it out on the guy, the person who's trying to help you, Correct. right? Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, I think the frustrations run high. Yeah. I think psychologists will look back upon the COVID years as being one of the real breakthroughs in our our history. Uh, So many things have changed. We've started looking at the way we treat the jobs differently than what we did then. Uh, It used to be everybody in the office. Now, a lot of people out of the office. The schools have been are, are, are different. Every element of our society, including the medical, is different. And it all happened very quickly over a period of about two or three years' time. And I don't think we'll ever go back to the way we were, but it's, there's a real lag time of even trying to go back to the way we were and looking at things the way we did prior to 2019. Well, and there's the drumbeat of fear during there's those years, too. Yeah. Everybody, which also adds to it, add to your list of of difficulty in healthcare, you watch television and everything's going to kill you, you know, and there's, there's a new pill or a new thing for everything that, that, that you might have. So there's just sort of this drumbeat of fear and negativity that I think, and there's no, during the COVID years, there was no escape. Yeah. You know? Let me read some, a text that Joe Ferretti sent. All of us know Joe from uh, the, the Friday. Uh, he says his daughter is a uh, ER doctor. She's about to leave a hospital because of concern for safeties, safety. Medical specialists are in short supply. Patients don't get prompt attention. attention. Uh, they don't get matters explained. They don't get timely uh, referrals. They don't get well fast enough. All of this builds up to the frustration. So Joe is in his very short text is uh, encapsulating exactly what you're saying Ashley so absolutely and I think there's even a missing factor to that actually two missing factors one is we still have people who either are reliant upon Medicaid which is not accepted by all providers a large part of our population can't get the medical care they need it's not even an option of they have to wait a long time for it but either they can't get it or they're going to the emergency room to get it. And then the second is the integration of technology into healthcare. A lot of times now there's some frustration, especially with our older population, that you they you need to do something with your healthcare and you have to go through an app 
or you have to go online to do it. Mm -hmm. And I hear all the time, well, I don't want to do that. I want to call and I want to talk to someone. And then you call and you have to work your way through the touch tone system to try to get to someone. And so both of those are also factors that are playing in here. And let me pick up on that a little bit. The older population, which I am I'm a member, uh, can very well remember that, uh, that you called the doctor and he would come to your house. He would make a house call. And that's the environment we were raised with. And even though that environment has long since been, uh, been gone, we still associate with that in our own mind. So the more we get toward the, the iPhone or the, uh, the iPad of doing everything by touch is, is even the ones of us that feel we're fairly familiar with an iPhone, I still become very frustrated when I have to do all my business on an iPhone. Of course, when the doctor would come to their, our house, he would then attach the leeches to bleed us out. <laughs> no, no, and no, 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 John. No, you're, you're kind of, yeah, you're, I know you're making a joke there, but I, that, that uh, group of, uh, of doctors uh, were probably the most sincere, the most caring group could ever find, and they were very... I think quite up to date considering. And I think they, they were, were very, that, they yeah. were certainly very caring. They were very, and, very caring. Uh, yeah. Ashley, what will the format be uh, when you get to the program and at more now toward the end of June? It wasn't going to be June 8th at Correct. first, but what will the format be in terms of how the information is gotten? So each person, each panelist will have a, just a couple of minutes to give an introduction and some information about them themselves and then we'll begin into the moderated discussion. Hans Vogel is moderating the discussion for us. He's done events with us in the past and always does an excellent job. And we will have a couple questions to start the panelists off, but then audience members will have the opportunity to ask questions live of the panelists. We will have two of our community engagement committee members with microphones that they can ask their question, the panelists can answer, and they can engage a little bit back and forth. Obviously, we want to give pe plenty of people enough time to participate. What's the duration? It'll be probably about an hour and a half. And I say about because a lot of times it depends on how the conversation goes. Mm -hmm. If it's crickets, then it'll be shorter. I expect that will not be the case. And so we will probably be around the hour, hour and a half, maybe hour and 45 minute um, Mark, what's typical attendance for these that you've done? Uh, and obviously, the numbers are weird because COVID has been involved the last couple of years. Exactly. So the per, the panel discussion that we did on infrastructure and growth, what we had about sixty five people attend. Now, this one I do expect will be larger as I've gotten feedback from the hospital systems. We are partnering with DV Medicine and Valley Health on that, and we're very grateful for their partnership. And they're sharing it with their staff and employees. I know that some of our medical community is interested. And of course, we have a lot of us who are engaging from the consumer side who really want the opportunity to express ourselves to our medical community. Before COVID, we had 125, 135 in that category. Mm -hmm. And what are you hoping comes out of this, Ashley? I'm really hoping that those who attend gain an awareness of the larger factors that are affecting our medical community, that it's not, it's not just Valley Health or JV Medicine, but that there are societal pressures. There's the medical or the provider shortage. There's the growth that's happening in the area that and what are the systems doing about that i want people to have an opportunity to really decompress about the pandemic and share what their experience was whether that's from the medical side or the consumer side and then really be able to engage in a meaningful conversation about what do we do about this going forward and why is it so important that we be able to engage in this discourse, this dialogue, so that we can lessen the stress and hopefully we can bring people back into being a medical provider so that way we can alleviate the shortage. Is there an admission charge? There is not. It is free and open to the public. And it is June the 29th now? Yes, at 6 o'clock. At 6 o'clock. And where will at, it be held? At the Bird and Health Sciences Center at Berkeley Medical Center. Thank you for coming in, Ashley. Thank you for having me. Ashley Horst from the Stubblefield Institute. We happen to have the namesake, uh, or at least half of it, right here in studio. Half of it. The uh, lesser known of the two namesakes. Yeah. <laughs>